I want you to imagine it's Easter Sunday morning. You're in church and your vicar or pastor delivers a sermon on the resurrection of Jesus and he starts the sermon like this. Forget about the picture of a body stepping out of a grave. That suggests a corpse come back to life on the physical plane. If that were what the idea of Christ's resurrection means, then it were better forgotten. Such a Christ is dead. I'm quoting from a sermon delivered in 1965 by Canon Geoffrey Lump in Birmingham, which was broadcast on the BBC. Do you think vicars should be allowed to reject the literal resurrection of Jesus? Or should they follow the confessions of their church? Should professors of divinity get immunity from church discipline? Today I want to uncover the background to this controversy in the Church of England. And I hope I'm going to share with you things that you won't find on Wikipedia or even on Cambridge University's website where there's an interesting section on Professor Lump. I'm going to try and uh, cover his uh, biographical details, his theological education and also his academic and church career. And by the end of this masterclass, I hope that you'll be able to place his theological claims in a broader historical background. And let me know in the end whether you find this helpful or any suggestions, things I could maybe improve on next time. Geoffrey Hugo Lump was born in 1912 in Bournemouth. Between 1926 and 31, he was educated at Blundell School, a distinguished independent school in Devon, he received a prize and between 1931 and 35, he read classics at Exeter College, Oxford, and then he decided to do an extra year in theology and he crammed seven subjects into one year and received a first class honours for that. In 1936, he decided to go to Queen's College, Birmingham, a liberal evangelical college to study theology with a view towards ordination. One of his friends noted that he never felt a real call to ministry. In 1937, he became deacon, and in 1938, he was ordained a vicar in the Church of England and had a short curacy in Orkenhampton, and then he became assistant master at the prestigious King's School in Canterbury. 1938 was not only the year that Lump was ordained, it was also a crucial year for the Church of England when it comes to doctrine. That was also the year that the Archbishop's Commission on Doctrine report was published. The reason for this report goes back to 1921, when the Modern Churchmen's Union Conference was held at Girton College in Cambridge. The series was called Christ and the Creeds and a number of ordained scholars in the Church of England gave papers, some of which were very controversial. One, for instance, was Hastings Rushdell, who challenged the divinity of Jesus Christ. Other scholars challenged the Incarnation. And after this conference, there was quite a stir in the media, and then the Archbishop decided to call together a doctrine commission who will look at all the different factions in the church and try to find a way forward. Let me quote for you the mandate he gave this commission. He said, The task of the commission is to consider the nature and grounds of Christian doctrine with a view to demonstrating the extent of agreement and investigating whether it is possible to diminish or remove these differences that exist. And then what happened a commission was brought together. Unfortunately, they did not include conservatives. They included what, the, what was called broad scholars and, and a large group of theological liberals, if you may use that word, uh, were also included in this commission. So the commission started their work in 1922 and they worked on it for several years until 1938 when it was published. Now, the reason it is crucial for Lump is that he wrote a large introduction to the second edition of this report, published much later, 
But in that introduction, he actually tells us that after this report was published, he made annotations of it. He uh, had several discussions with vicars in his diocese about it. So you could see he was really captivated by the controversies intrinsic in this report. Now, they discussed incarnation, the sacraments, uh, church and state, uh, the atonement. Uh, but I want to focus today on what this report said about the resurrection of Jesus to illustrate the controversy of this report. So the report said Jesus' rising was a real and as concrete an event as the crucifixion. Some on the commission believed the story of the empty tomb to be a symbol of this fact. Others held the traditional explanation. Now there was an appended note on page 86 and 7 which stated that some Jewish conceptions of bodily resurrection shaped the traditions in the Gospels. This inclined some to the belief that the connection between the empty tomb and the appearances belong rather to the sphere of religious symbolism than to historical fact. To others, it seemed essential to the full Christian hope that death should be reversed by resurrection. So do you see what happened here? Reinterpreting the resurrection in a symbolical way was brought into the Doctrine Commission as a viable alternative for skeptics. The reason this is crucial for Lump is because we will see later on how these accommodations provided the platform for his own theological development later on. Now, just to round off the report, I think it is appropriate just to quote William Temple, who later on became Archbishop, uh, who was the chairman of this committee. And just to take one sentence from his intro introduction, he noted, To admit acrimony in theological discussion is in itself more fundamentally heretical than any erroneous opinions upheld or condemned in the course of the discussion. Temple clearly wanted to embrace the liberals and the conservative views in one church and wanted to uh, promote unity before orthodoxy. And that comes out time after time in this whole report. After the war, uh, Lump became chaplain at St. John's College in Oxford in 1946. And in 1953 to 1960, he became professor at the University of Birmingham. Between 1960 and 1970, he became canon theologian at Ely Cathedral and professor of divinity at Cambridge University. Just a note about being canon theologian at Ely. That was quite a strategic place to be because, as we know, Cambridge uh, and all the theological students who want to train for ordination going to Ridley Hall, West, Westcott House and so forth, they would all have been under the spiritual authority, if you may, of Ely Cathedral and with Lump being there in a very strategic position must uh, imply that he had quite a substantial influence on the next generation of theologians. Between 1970 and 1979, Lump became the distinguished Regis Professor of Divinity at Cambridge University. Of course, a very distinguished position only for a select few reserved with a very, very uh, illustrious CV behind their names. Now, I think that gives us a broad overview of Lump's biographical details, his theological education, and then his academic career. And now it's time to jump in to the 1966 controversy. Uh, the sermon he delivered in 1965, the book that was published uh, in 1966, and I'm going to try to understand the substance of his understanding of the resurrection. I'll read us a couple of citations and then I will also uh, delve into the Q&A after the, uh, the sermon. The BBC recorded this 
and they had six guests who could ask him questions. There were two women and four men, and I found particularly helpful the questions one woman on this commission asked. I'm going to read those, and then I will give a brief overview of some theological trends in Lump's thought as he outlined it here. And then after this, I will quickly link it up to the myth of God incarnate controversy in 1977, where he also had an interesting role to play. And then I'll finish up and draw everything to a close. So just to recap, during that sermon Lump delivered at Birmingham, he made the following claim. Forget the picture of a body stepping out of a grave. Such a Christ is dead. So I want to read for us. Uh, Mrs. Bell, who asked two probing questions to Professor Lump afterwards. Professor Lump, you said this morning, referring to the sort of pictures we have just seen, that they suggest a corpse come back to life on the physical plane, and that if that were all that the idea of Christ's resurrection means, then it were better forgotten. Why is it better forgotten? Is one not able to believe that Christ was resurrected in a physical form and still be an intelligent Christian? After all, it is what the church has believed for 2,000 years, isn't it? And here's Professor Lump's response. I shouldn't want to say at all that it isn't possible to be an intelligent Christian and take the story of the empty tomb as a literal historical fact. After all, a great many highly intelligent Christians do. I do not, myself. I regard the story of the empty tomb as myth rather than literal history and profoundly significant as myth. Later on, Mrs. Bell asked the following question. But Mary Magdalene and the other Mary clasped the feet of the risen Jesus. This is recorded in St. Matthew. If he wasn't in physical form, how could this be? Professor Lump responded, Your question raises the whole problem of the nature and value of the historical evidence for what happened at Easter. And then in the following chapter, Professor Lump is obviously quoting from what one can regard as liberal German scholarship from the early 20th century where it was often held that Paul believed in a spiritual resurrection, whereas the Gospels portray Jesus in physical form, and that Paul wrote first, and therefore the Gospels represent later legendary developments in light of Jewish expectations of a physical resurrection. And that was the dominant view in German scholarship. Of course, today that is not the norm anymore, but that was current at the time. Now that gives us just a brief overview of the controversy in 1966. And of course, you did have conservatives who responded and rejected these claims. There were books written. You had in the same uh, book, Professor McKinnon, a well-regarded professor who challenged some of his views. But it is crucial to understand that Professor Lump was never censured or disciplined by the Church of England for making these claims. The question is, why? My theory is, it goes back to William Temple as chairman of the Doctrine Commission and the report that was published in 1938. How can you discipline someone for making a claim about the resurrection 30, 40 years after you've already embraced it and included it as a viable alternative explanation for the resurrection? Now, to finish this conversation, I will just briefly mention the myth of God controversy in 1977. Why is Lump crucial for that conversation? The main reason is that basically all of the controversies in that book, which is discussed at length in this book by Michael Golder, for instance, were accommodated to some extent in the 1938 report. You have, for instance, Michael Golder, who wrote two uh, chapters in myth in which he renounced the virgin birth the atonement, the resurrection is explained as uh, conversion experiences and the empty tomb is rejected. And then what happened, the myth of God was discussed at Synod in 1978. And then there were calls to censure the contributors who were ordained vicars who participated in myth. And then Professor Lump jumped up 
Well, I say jumped up. Maybe he just stood up. And he then had the genius idea to say, but everybody should first read the book before anything can be said. Now, that was a crucial strategic moment. And we know uh, from history that censure then never occurred after that. So there is a different perspective on the life and scholarship of Professor Lump and why it was possible for him to, in 1965, to claim that Jesus' resurrection did not occur literally, the empty tomb traditions are regarded as myth, and he was allowed to preach these views as an ordained vicar in the Church of England. Now, let's wrap up. Let's ask a couple of questions. Should religious professors of divinity get immunity when it comes to doctrines? Should they be allowed to do their research and preach these uh, new views without any consequences? Should vicars believe that Jesus rose literally from the dead? Is there a tension between academic research and the gospel and faith? Let me know in the footnotes below what you think. Uh, what do you think about some of these interesting things that I've explored today? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for spending it with me. And I'd love to hear back from you. And if you think this could be worthwhile for you or some of your friends, maybe even some who aren't evangelical, but hopefully I've included some interesting information that even will benefit those who are not part of our theological tradition.